Right, radio TV phono nut here, and we have an old 19-inch Emerson TV from 1988 that I rescued from being thrown in a thrift store dumpster. Going through our usual dose of daytime trash television. As you can see, the vertical height is insufficient. And I bleed the picture tubes a little bit soft. Not unusable, but a little soft. When I first turned it on earlier, it was very blurry and blowing out. And when I turn the contrast up, you can see it. You can see when I turn it down, it kind of sharpens up a bit. When I turn it up, it kind of blows out, so... The Marcus King Band in Memphis, Tennessee is Diddy TV. This is a song called 8 a.m. Los Alamos National... Find something that won't get flagged, maybe. Well, the grayscale looks pretty good. All right, let's get it down and try to straighten out its issues. But yeah, this TV and about three or four other black plastic crap sets were sitting out in the parking lot close to the dumpster. So I grabbed this one, and yes, they said I could have it. I don't know why I really grabbed it. I really don't have any affection for it, but I was just curious to see if it would even power up because I remember working on these sets back in the 90s and a good many of them I saw had bad flyback transformers and here this one's 33 years old and still firing up. Whether it's on its original flyback or not, I don't know. We'll find out in a minute, but... I remember when these sets were new, they came in several versions in 13 and 19 inch sizes. The first version I remember had a 14 button bare actor push button tuner. And you open the door here and you have the little thumb wheel controls to fine tune each channel in, sort of like an old VCR. And then the one up from that was the remote controlled version with said tuner. And then the one up from that was this model with the cable-ready tuner. Of course, none of that really matters anymore with everything being digital. All you really need is channels 3 and 4, and you're good to go. Now, I remember back in about 87, we had a little 13-inch tube-type true-tone color TV on our camper, and it got to the point it was uh, giving trouble, and that was really before I started messing with TVs and dad took it to every TV shop he could find and when, and when they found out it was a tube type television they didn't want to touch it so the last one he took it to who refused it he said well I'm tired of lugging this thing around will you throw it away for me and they said yes we'll dispose of it for you and that was the end of the little true tone I remember it had a vertical sink issue it would work fine when you first turned it on and then after it warmed up the picture would gradually start rolling and the longer it warmed up the worse the roll got I figure there probably wasn't much wrong with it but you know by the late 80's most shops were no longer accepting TVs that old for repair so there you go and he bought a little 13 inch Emerson that was the bottom of the line version with the standard two knob VHF and UHF tuner I believe it was actually made by Orion. I think that set was $149. The one with the non-remote very active tuner was $179 maybe. The remote one with the very active tuner was $199 and the cable ready 13 inch was $219 or $229 or something. I don't remember. Now, as far as Emerson TVs, they pretty much got out of the TV business in about 1970 as far as building them themselves. And then for a few years, they there were some Admiral built sets with the Emerson badge on them. 
and then they got out of the TV business all together until about 1982 at which time they started uh, getting TVs from Gold Star and then Orion I think this is an Orion built set and then I don't know sometime in the 90's they sold out to Funai so let's open this up and see what we got on the inside uh, assembled in USA from USA and foreign components manufactured March of 88 and I really wasn't aware that Orion had an assembly plant in the States but I guess they did or I don't know what the deal was really maybe somebody will tell me uh, here's the inside it has a sideways mounted chassis now the last one of these I worked on was probably about 10 or 12 years ago Somebody heard about me and bought me a set like this, and he said, I've had this TV since it was new. It's always given me good service. I like the picture on it, and I'd like it repaired if possible. Uh, he went on to say that he took it to another TV shop, and they pretty bluntly told him to throw that piece of trash in the creek and go buy you a real television. Now, I can guarantee you telling somebody that is the best way to lose a customer for life. I think even if it's an old TV, you know, you should at least look at it for the customer and evaluate it. And then if you look at it and, and determine that it's really not worth repairing, then you can be honest with the customer. And But, you know, smarting off to somebody like that and insulting their product is, is a good way to run them off for life. So his TV just had some bad capacitors and bad solder connections and he was back in business and he took his TV and I never saw him again. Now here's the picture tube. It's an Orion labeled tube but has an EIA code of 1101 which is Rawland which Rawland was a division of Zenith so that might explain why this tube is a little soft because it was around 88 or so when the the quality of Rawland and Zenith picture tubes, all the same tubes, started taking a nose dive. They didn't really get bad until the early 90s, but you know, I've seen plenty of mid to late 80s Zenith tubes that were shot. And I'm not going to try to rejuvenate this tube. Uh, I'm just going to adjust it for the best picture and let it go because it's been my findings that if you pop these zenith tubes from this time period they'll often look worse after you pop them than they did before so we're just going to leave it alone all right i think this chassis is held to the front panel with some two or three phillips head screws now here's the chassis and if you ever work on these one thing you want to be careful for is these little buttons like to fall off in fact this one fell off and was laying inside of the set so you want to pay attention to that now the biggest problem as I remember with these sets was loose solder connections on the AKB board, that's the automatic Kenny bias, which eliminates the eliminates the presence of uh grayscale gray scale controls and of course the flyback and when it would go it would take the horizontal output transistor with it. And of course various capacitors in the sweep circuit and power supply and, and that's that about covers it. Warning, live chassis. Well, I guess that's better than a dead chassis. And I noticed on the power plug, somebody filed down the wide blade of the uh, polarized plug, so obviously they were plugging this into a very old outlet that was uh, non-polarized. Now before we go grabbing the uh, second anode connector up here to disconnect it, we need to discharge it just in case there's still a charge left on the tube. Uh, so the way I like to do that is just clip a, take a screwdriver here and attach a clip lead to it and then attach the other end of the clip lead to the, to the uh, DAG ground strap here on the CRT and then slowly run the blade of the screwdriver under the suction cup and make contact with the connector and Depending on how charged up the tube is, you might get quite a loud snap pop spark, but you really need to discharge the tube before uh, monkeying around with that anode connector.
Yeah, I heard a little pop there, but not what it could have been. Now, you do it one time, and you do it again, and it's best just to let it, let it sit under there for a few minutes, because sometimes these tubes will recharge. So we'll just let that sit a minute or two. All right, that's good, so we'll pull it off, slip it under there again, and if I don't hear another pop, come on, get under there now. All right, good, no pop, so this thing should be discharged. And there it is. It's just held on to the anode connection by this little clip. And when you reinsert it, you want to make sure that both ends of this clip are inside the uh, anode connection. Now that everything's disconnected, we can take the chassis down to the workbench and start going over it. Okay, so far I haven't seen anything that looked too, too terribly bad, but just as a precaution... Went ahead and resoldered the flyback transformer, the horizontal driver transformer. That seems to be a common problem in all brands of sets. They develop loose connections and then cause the horizontal output transistor here to short, which I resoldered in some of these other connections. There's also a number of 2 watt power resistors that I resoldered. You know, they were kind of blackened around the circuit board, so went ahead and resoldered them so there wouldn't be any trouble and resoldered a few things up here, the degaussing thermistor, etc. Uh, these boards were obviously not soldered by hand, they were soldered by a machine and often not soldered that great from the factory and after 30 years of heating and cooling some of the connections can break loose, especially on high temperature parts such as resistors and heat sink mounted transistors and ICs etc. I also touched up the socket and the output transistors on this uh, CRT driver board. Now we're going to have to remove the AKB board which I believe is right here. Or where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Is that it? Yeah that's it right there. We need to get that out because unfortunately there are connections on there that are bad about failing and I need to remove the board in order to get to them so we'll need to get our desoldering braid and unsolder these connections here and here's the AKB also known as the automatic Kenny bias board that automatically sets the grayscale based on the uh, condition of the CRT etc and it eliminates the need to have external drive and uh, bias controls and what usually happens to these, these pins where it solders onto the main circuit board as well as these pins here and these pins here where the cable solders to that goes to the CRT socket board develops crack solder connections so I'm just going to go ahead and take care of all of that now so we won't have to take care of it in the future okay resoldered this connector and this connector everything else seems okay so now we're ready to install this back on the main board and resolder it and then that should take care of that okay the AKB board is resoldered and back in place and I also resoldered the vertical output IC that's another cause of a common problem in all brands of sets, loose connections on the IC pins. Although those seem to be in pretty good shape, I just went ahead and resoldered them. And now I'm going to pull out some capacitors and check them that are known to be problems in these sets. And, and if they seem to be a little iffy, we'll go ahead and... Re okay, I replaced a few caps in the uh, vertical and power supply. They didn't check all that bad, but they're high failure parts, so I went ahead and got rid of them. The only one I didn't replace is this one microfarad 160 volt that's in the horizontal drive circuit because I don't have any of those on hand, and this cap still checks pretty good, so I just leave it alone. Alright, I'm about ready to go put this back in the cabinet and then adjust the vertical size control if need be and then hopefully this thing will be ready to go okay a word about capacitors was it really necessary necessary for me to change these few probably not all of them but since they cause problems I went ahead and got rid of them 
Now, am I going to re ever recap this whole chassis? No, but there's a certain Facebook group having to deal with main, mainly newer CRT televisions from the 90s and 2000s, mainly for the purpose of retro gaming. And I've seen guys on there talk about recapping their 21st century uh, JVCs and Sonys, which, you know, if you want to spend the bucks and take the time to do it, then knock yourself out, but it's generally totally unnecessary. The main, the main capacitors that I see fail and TVs from the 80s and newer are generally in the sweep circuits and the power supply, and that's pretty much it. For some rare, except for some rare occasions, and of course there are those Mitsubishi TVs made from the mid '80s through the early '90s that the capacitors like to spooge all over the place in and make a big mess. Now those you might have to recap as well as clean up the mess, and as well as uh, jump out any foil traces that the electrolyte ate through. And in fact, it finally got to the point where I just stopped taking in taking in Mitsubishi's from that time period because they were just so so time consuming to get going again. It just wasn't worth it. Now, as far as the flyback transformer, and this is basically the basic design of flyback transformer that you're going to find in most CRT televisions from about 19. Oh, the early 80s through the end of the CRT era, and even some of the Japanese-built sets from the mid-70s even had something similar to this. We have the we have the actual flyback high-voltage transformer itself in here, as well as the high-voltage rectifier slash tripler assembly, the focus divider assembly and your adjustments for your focus and screen controls are all in this one little package. And not only does this, this transformer, not only is it responsible for producing high voltage for the picture tube, it also produces focus voltage, G2 voltage, and on the bottom here, all those pins provide low voltage for most of the uh, operating circuitry in the television. So that transformer is under a lot of stress to be such a small package and over the years the insulation breaks down, they absorb moisture and they eventually just short out and either arc out and burn or they just internally short and blow the horizontal output transistor. In fact if you get one of these sets with a blown hot you better just go ahead and change the flyback too because I don't think I've ever ran up on one of these sets with a shorted hot where the flyback wasn't bad as well. And this is going to be, this flyback is going to be what kills most of these 80s and later TVs because sooner or later they will fail and when they fail you're probably going to have a hard time getting them. Now during the CRT era I could get these. In fact I've replaced a lot of this particular flyback with the ECG equivalent that the parts house sold, and I never had any trouble with those. However, in later years, I had trouble with some of the no-name white box, white box generics that came out of either China or Mexico. I had one of those that I ordered from a place. And I specifically told them, I want an RCA original. I don't want no crap generic. Well, what do they send me? A crap generic. I stuck it in the TV. It was a big 36-inch home theater set. Played it about 20 minutes. Turned it off. Turned it on the next day, and it sounded like a gunshot in my, in my workshop. And that brand-new generic flyback blew up. Big crack around the outside of the case with pieces of the windings hanging out the side. And when I tracked down an RCA original from somebody else, I stuck that in there and the TV worked great, no problems. But nowadays, since there's very little demand for TVs of this type to be repaired, it's getting hard to find these. If I'd done some digging, I might could find one of these flybacks somewhere, but probably in a few years, forget it. You're not going to find one. And 
they give no warning when they're about to fail. They just they just fail. That's just the way it is. I could put this one back together and it can last 30 seconds and pop, or it can last another 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Who knows? Okay, I'm ready to put the chassis back in the television, but before I do, we're going to discharge the CRT again just to make sure that the uh, that a charge didn't uh, regenerate. Okay, let's make sure we're cl we're clear. Okay, we're clear. No spark, no pop, no nothing. So that's good. All right, is it gonna is it gonna work or not? All right, my chassis's not in there all the way. All right, our focus is still a little soft, and we need to tweak our vertical size control, so we'll do that now. All right, that looks a good bit better. Now I need to adjust the vertical size and see if we can bring that out a little bit. All right, I have the chassis out where I can get to the vertical size control. I don't know why they don't put those along the rear apron where you, where you can get to them easier. All right, that looks better. Now I think we can put it all back together and call it a day. All right, we're back together. Okay, so why is it not coming on now? Because the chassis wasn't seated all the way and the uh, power button wasn't making contact with the actual switch on the bolt. Okay, take two. It's better. This set does have an auto color button. Basically all it is is when you press the button in and it engages a set of preset controls, but when I push it in, it throws the tin off. I could have adjusted that while I was in there, but there's really no need to. That's just a gimmick anyway. You just turn the button off and adjust it how you want it on the front. Ooh, look at the old radio. What is this? Shortwave radio. All right, I've been eyeing this thing backstage. I think I'm going to go to Allie first and see what she thinks of this. We are looking at a piece of audio history right here. This well, I guess I need to adjust the vertical some more. Dead gummit, I didn't quite. I adjusted it too much. All right. Next, we're going to go to our gearhead, and I know this is really not your forte, but give me your thoughts. I dig it. It has that old, cool, vintage look like the Victrola Rector player back in the day. Really All right. Cool. And it's hey, worth six million dollars. One thousand dollars for everything here. Thousand dollars. All right. I'll mm, see if we good can luck that. with that. All right. Let's bring in our bidders. Good luck right, with that. A very cool item for you. It's a shortwave radio. Uh, it looks like it's in immaculate condition, but I'm going to let our seller tell you more about it right but now. But I'm sure they'll run it up graciously right just now. for the sake of uh, yeah, boosting their ratings. It's a Neuterdyne receiver. A Neuterdyne. Ooh. Made in 1923. Has a Bakelite front. It's A20 tubes, just like you see here. And we have all of the tubes. It has the... The speaker that goes with it, which was made by Stromberg Carlson in the 1890s, they put together. The dials are turned in to get the uh, best uh, channel. And if you look up here, what you can see is all the channels that they used to listen to. And the first one is KFI Radio. Yeah, you got to love this radio digital crap. April 16, 1922, and so this machine came to be in 1923, so they listened to radio on it. I don't like this range would it get. I'm just wondering right. how far you could pick up something. So this particular machine they should all the way to Canada. Wow. So that's some very long range for nineteen twenty three. Right. And Armstrong had it was built this one was I'll oh, cut it out. Best model you could possibly buy. It sold for one hundred and fifty dollars back in nineteen twenty-three, which you needed to be very wealthy to own it. All right. Well, we're up to two hundred and sixty-five dollars already. Yeah, I am fascinated by this. I, and I'm going to ask you this question because I'm not even quite sure what the answer is. 
I know there's still shortwave radio people out there. Right. Would this still work with the it tube? It will field? still work. Yep. Because it's so clean and it has the copper conductors on the inside, but everything is very, very clean and everything works in perfect condition once the tubes are put in. It'll run beautifully. Okay. Really? Perfect. Show me. So would somebody? Because tubes wear out, they blow out. Where where would someone go to purchase tubes that are compatible? There are many stores that carry antique tubes, and you can find them. Just Google it. i got tons of questions for you, but I'm going to jump to Sam in Charlotte. What's your question? I just, I just want to say that's an amazing piece, and I just wanted to know if it's still in working order. It is still in working order. If we put the tubes in, we'll be able to fire this thing up, and this thing will work. Well, then fire right, it up so and show us. Is this. What's the learning curve here? Would you advise someone to maybe get a book on shortwave radio? You can buy the book that actually came with this radio. It's about $25. You can, however, go to the Natural History Museum and look at one if you'd like. But yeah. these are pretty rare pieces. And in this condition, I have seen them before, but they're usually cracked and just destroyed. Yeah, I mean, this thing is in mint condition. There's no real markings on the wood. Uh, I just love the looks of this thing, and it's just incredible. And I love, I wish we, I wish we had it hooked up, because I'd love to hear it coming out of the speaker. Uh, why don't I, let me go to Allie for just a second, because I bet you have some yeah. figures and facts for me. Yeah, well, no, I was just going to acknowledge there is one, only one in the National History Museum. They have one in the National History Museum. And so that doesn't mean it's really valuable. There today because I feel like this is the only one I've seen in a while. The last one I saw in this condition was sold in 2009, in this kind of condition. That doesn't mean that... Uh, maybe a newer 1925 uh, model or a 1927 model it hasn't been sold, or you may find one on eBay. But you're not going to find it in this condition. Right, yeah, and this is. is the first year. This is a 1923. This is the first year that this piece came out. I mean, it is in beautiful condition. I mean, even the cords are still together, which is amazing after that long. All right, Cheryl, I'm looking at this whole piece, but I think that the really true is, is this material that's up here. So this is Bakelite. And Bakelite is the first plastic ever made. Just amazing. All right. Well, I believe we have something from my man, Mike. You know, Bill, what's really cool is they used Bakelite in cars in the 1920s and 30s. Wow. This thing looks amazing. Can you tell me a little bit where you found it? So this has an amazing backstory. We have a company called Antiques on Magnolia, and we do estate sales. And the great thing about this piece is that we found it in an attic. It was wrapped in newspaper dated 1946. And that's right at the end of World War II. So these people that owned this piece were Nazi sympathizers. And they used to listen to all the Hollywood gossip regarding the Nazis between 1936 and 1945. And when the war basically came to an end, they took this, they wrapped it in newspaper, and they threw it in the attic. And not until we found it in uh, 2017 did this see the light of day. Wow. That, that is a major backstory. This is a major backstory, and this is a major piece of history. All right, Bitters, you heard that. I mean, that's an amazing story. All right, let's get on with the prize. Come on. From Connecticut. You got a question for us? Hey, guys, this is a really great piece. I'm wondering if it still communicate with modern ham radios. Because it's a shortwave radio, it can. Ha modern ham radios and shortwave radios still work on the same frequency. You would just have to tune in the proper... And see the, all these... And by the way... Watch or see this kind of crap, and they think their old radios worth ten fortunes, and you can't convince them otherwise because... In L.A. today. They saw it on one of these uh, bogus TV programs. So basically they can listen to the radio. Right. That's what the speaker was used for. So this speaker is actually made by a telephone company. Back in 1894 through 1930. This particular one was made actually during that period. So this speaker could be used for your telephone, or again, this was plugged into the front of this machine right here as it is now, right? And you could listen to everything through it. The only way you could actually hear through this machine anyway is going to be through a speaker like that. Okay, we're about out of time on the camera battery, so I'm not going to be able to get the whole thing. What are we up to? Current bid, 515 smackers. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Stick with us to hear the hammer price on this rare shortwave radio. But I'm thinking the conversation is just 
It is. I mean, especially with the back story that you just told us. That's, it is. That's crazy. It's a great piece. Even if you didn't ever start it up, even if you didn't ever put the tubes in it, it is an amazing piece just to have on your mantle. And she just said it could take up to 45 minutes to warm up. I call BS on that, don't you? Allie, Allie, you got a thought for me? During the night, Six. $850. All right, 850 smackers. All right, here's a completed listing for a radio that looks like the one on that show ended for uh, $112.50. And figure the speaker might go for oh, probably about that amount, maybe a little more. Here's one in a little bit more upscale cabinet with a fold down front that went for two twenty five, And nothing for the Stromberg Carlson speaker. Now, yeah, that's eBay pricing, but... Yard sale, flea market, estate sale pricing would be even lower than that. Although some of these clowns think because something sold on eBay or because some somebody's asking a ludicrous price for something on eBay, then that's what they think they ought to get for theirs. But I've told a few of them, well, if it's worth so much on eBay, then that's where you need to sell it because nobody's going to give you an eBay price at an estate sale or a yard sale. But you can't get these clowns to figure that out. So, but suffice it to say, when they start that, uh, it's worth so much on eBay crap with me. I leave it with them. I don't even waste my time trying to deal with them because you're just wasting your time because they've got it in their head what their what their item is worth, and you're not going to convince them otherwise. Okay, we're back on the TV, and we're going to use the converter box set to widescreen mode. So we have the black borders at the top and bottom of the screen, and then we're going to go back into this, and there's also a vertical centering control, and we're going to adjust that. But yeah, this is my fault. I was too hasty to get this thing adjusted and get it back together, and I really wasn't paying attention to what I was doing, so... Now we're going to have to go back in it again and adjust it properly. Well, I did something stupid and irresponsible again. No, I didn't kill the TV, but I was adjusting something and I noticed the picture shrinking in on all four sides and expanding as I was adjusting this control. And I looked, and me not paying attention was adjusting the B-plus control instead of the vertical controls over here. Now, not knowing what the B-plus is supposed to be, and they don't give you that information on the chassis naturally, and on these, even on solid-state TVs, it's important that you have the B-plus set right. If it's too high, that will affect the high voltage and put more stress on the flyback transformer, and, of course, we don't need that. So I got online to look for a free service manual for this TV, which is a model ECR2100D, and of course everything I found was these sites wanting me to uh, pay for a service manual, and I'm not paying for a service manual on a junker TV that I'm probably going to end up just giving away anyhow. So. I did some more looking, and I found a, a power supply schematic for an ECR1350, which is the 13-inch version that uses this same basic chassis, and the B-plus for that set is 127 volts, so if my memory serves me correctly, the B-plus for the 13 and 19 were the same, so we'll just adjust this for 127 volts and see how it goes. All right, 127. Let's turn the brightness and contrast down. And it should remain within spec. And it does. And that's good. new home and new projects go hand in hand. With the Home Depot app, you'll pick it up in no time. So I'm going to adjust this and try to get it spot on. That's good, right there. Alright, that's pretty close right there. So now I'm going to go back to full screen mode and tweak the size control and then hopefully we'll be done. Okay, that's about as good as I'm going to get it. 
Now keep in mind when using the DTV box on uh, full screen mode, the sides and tops and bottoms of your picture are going to be cut, so you're not you're not going to see everything. That's one of the things I've heard people complain about using these older TVs is part of your picture gets cut off, but in all actuality, what you're paying most attention to is going to be in the center of the screen anyway, so in many cases that's not an issue, or at least not for me. And if there's something I do need to see, like a crawler on the bottom of the screen or something, I can just push the button on the box to get it back to get it back to cropped mode or whatever it is, whatever it shows on there, wide mode, whatever it is on the menu to, so I can see the crawler on the bottom of the screen. Alright, here it is back together. I don't know what I'll do with it, whether I'll just keep it here as backup in case one of my sets takes a dump or put it on the Facebook baby clothes and cell phone pages for 20 bucks and see if anybody buys it around here. Probably not. Now, a lot of people tell me, especially those who live away from here, oh, you're, oh, you're selling your stuff too cheap. That's way too cheap to be letting that stuff go for. Well, that all depends on where you're located, I suppose. If you live in a, a highly populated area with a good economy and a, and a heavy population of hipsters and retro-minded people, then yeah. I could probably advertise something like this for fifty, seventy-five, a hundred dollars or more, and somebody'd run right over here and get it. But where I am, when the economy's bad and all people are interested in is alcohol and meth and smartphones, then you know it's hard to get much for something like this. And based on what I've seen in my area, the retro retro gamer crowd is not very big around here. In fact, I've only met one person who wanted a television to connect their old Atari to, and I just gave it to them. It was a little 9-inch RCA color set, and they wanted something to connect their old Atari from probably the early 80s to, and they were happy to get it. So, But as far as somebody wanting a TV like this to watch, you can just about forget it. If you do find somebody that wants one like this, it'll be an elderly person, and then once they find out they have to buy a $50 converter box to receive anything on it, then they're not interested. Now, the guy at the flea market told me that he sold a few to older people who purposely wanted something old and outdated because they knew if somebody broke in their house, then they wouldn't be as likely to steal it. Or in other cases, these older TVs are so big and heavy and bulky, they're not as likely to get knocked over by pets or kids or whatever. And I can't tell you how many people have called me after they just bought a brand new flat screen that weighed all of five pounds, and then when the kid whacks it with a baseball bat or knocks it over or whatever, and then it cracks the panel, and then... They cry when I tell them that the panel will cost more than what you paid for the whole TV if you can even get a panel. And the whole time I'm thinking, whenever I was a kid, I was raised not to do stuff like that. I knew if I knocked the TV off the cart or hit it with something and broke it, then I'd get something across my rear end that I wouldn't soon forget. But, you know, these kids today are largely not taught consequences. They're allowed to do whatever they want to do and whenever they want to or whenever they want to do it and that's just the way it is. So what this thing basically needed was just a little time for the picture tube to wake up and some adjustments. And then we replaced some critical capacitors that have been known to cause trouble and resoldered some questionable solder connections and this T V appears to be good to go. Now how long it'll last is anybody's guess. It may go five minutes, it may go five years, but that's the only thing about selling something like this because so many people today have the Walmart mentality. You know, they give me 20 bucks for something like this and then take it home and the flyback pops in it and 
that afternoon or the next day, then they think they can just wag it back over here and get a refund. And in my mind, it don't work that way. When you buy something used for a cheap price, then it's it, it's yours. But so many people today are just used to, oh, if I don't like it, I'm going to go demand my money back. Well, that may work on eBay and at Walmart, but it ain't going to work over here. But yeah, this TV has a pretty decent picture on it now to be a a cheapo set.